Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. We are available online at survivingscientologyradio.com or at Surviving Scientology on YouTube. Today we have with us Steve Hall, the owner of Scientology-Cult.com, one of the best websites out there. Highly recommend you read it. Steve was in Sea Org for a long time. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Steve, just how long were you in the Church of Scientology? Well, I got in in 79, left in 2003, so uh, I was in the Sea Org about 20 years, and before that I was on staff in various other organizations. Yeah, well, you, now, Steve, you were in, you were in a uh, pretty key marketing job in the Sea Organization, weren't you? Yeah, I was. I was the senior writer for the church, which means, uh, you know, the copywriter uh, traditionally in advertising is the person that comes up with the ideas for the various campaigns. So the copywriter is normally the idea person, and that's, you know, the, you don't have a marketing campaign until you have the, what the idea is, you know, the creative strategy is what we call it. So, uh, yeah, I had an opportunity for several years to set the, uh, the direction for uh, the church's marketing and was doing it successfully until that got shit-canned by Miscavige. I understand. What are some of the projects you worked on? What are some of the marketing campaigns? Oh, I worked on a bunch of Dianetic stuff. I um, uh, did the, the largest campaign for, the, for Scientology itself in, in 1997 and 1998. Uh, that included like 28 television ads, um, you know, scores of print ads and all kinds of stuff. And uh, um, two of the books that we actually did ads for became national bestsellers through uh, – uh, Ingram's booksellers, you know, on trade lines. Really? Yeah. yeah. That was uh, two, two of Hubbard's, you know, old Scientology books, Fundamentals of Thought, and another one called New Slant on Life. Now, um, <clears throat> it was, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, I, I found out, though, you know, after spending all, you know, doing all that work and putting all this effort into the whole thing, that the whole thing was a farce anyway, because uh, after about two months of running the campaign, which there was enough ads there to go on for two to three years easily. And, uh, you know, Miscavige just de decided that the girl that was running the thing uh, named Manu Spencer, that she was, quote, out ethics. That means, you know, Scientology parlance. That means the not being ethical in some way. It's just it's just a complete generality, really. And, and so sure. she was vanished and uh, all the finances to the campaign were abruptly severed. After two months, and this was a huge, huge campaign um, that w had been put together, and uh, the whole thing just ended right there. And then I realized that at that, that point, I, it began to dawn on me that the whole purpose for all these, quote, uh, you know, dissemination campaigns, they call them in, in, in the church, um, and they're all designed for, like, public outreach. The real reason was simply to elicit donations from Scientologists. And that was the, really what was going on. It was, in other words, 100 percent corrupt, 100 percent criminal, 100 percent fake. Well, would you say that that is it's a it's a bait and switch? They claim they're reaching the public, disseminating, but they're just fundraising. That's exactly right. And Steve, this raises a great point. Uh, the church endlessly raises money for anything and everything. And what, what's so confounding, I think, I think the public really doesn't understand, but they're beginning to. The Church of Scientology exists, in my opinion, solely and only to raise money. Right. And it seems like the Church of Fundraisingology, and it's become a runaway machine. So if you – the logic doesn't make sense to me as a businessman. If I create a campaign to sell something, I'll, I'll run it through to the end. Right. And, you know, you, you design a campaign, you have your key people, you execute because you do want to raise brand awareness, sell products. But if, if DM and David Miscavige at a whim can RPF someone and close down a campaign, does that mean he hit his fundraising target and has really no interest? Well, you know, it's I mean, I, I it's it's. It's like the, uh, the reality doesn't match the, uh, uh, the illusion of what's being done. In other words, on the surface, uh, and, and actually earlier, I mean, when I started, you know, in, in, in Scientology in 1979, things were very different. And they weren't perfect then, but they were 
almost as different from what it is today as night versus day. In other words, back then there were no uh, donation campaigns just straight where, you know, give us your money and you get nothing in return. That was um, the church only sold services and uh, and courses. That's it. So uh, today, now they hardly sell any services. Now it's just, well, give us your money. Why? Because we said so. And if you don't, then you'll get in trouble. Um, and so somewhere along the line, uh, obviously, in fact, I remember uh, the, there was a there was a lady who worked under me um, in the uh, late 1990s. Um, her, her name was Becky, and she had at one point been a uh, her profession was was in getting uh, uh, donations from people and grants. OK, so she had brought up the point like, hey, you know, we could be getting, you know, government grants and. Um, and so forth. And they started they started on this whole idea of, wow, you know, free money. And um, and, you know, the IAS, which also didn't exist at the time when I joined, but started in 1984. In fact, I was at uh, the international headquarters in 1984 when um, the the uh, senior executives were working on this very campaign to actually writing all the, the foundational issues for um, the the IAS, which is the International Association of Scientologists, and uh, um, you know they're they're actually in uh, Guillaume Reserve's name, which is he was the executive director international, but of course the one calling the shots was guarantee was uh, David Miscavige. He was the one that, you know approving and 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 authorizing and and directing exactly what needed to happen. So. Uh, um, this thing grew and it became a source. It became a complete cash, cash cow and a source for free money. And they just added more and more people on there and found that, you know, you can get any amount of money. Just add more, uh, you know, more salespeople there and they just keep on getting the money. And then I think he eventually figured out that what do we need all this, you know, messing with new people for? Because really the amount of money that he could make from one Tom Cruise or one John Travolta or one, you know, rich person, uh, dwarfed the amount of money that could be produced uh, on more on, along more legitimate lines. And so they just said, what the hell with all that? Or he did, really. And and just has now, you know, the uh, the wart on the toe has got to be bigger than the whole rest of the body. And now the IAS is the only really the only uh, primary function of the church. It is 100 percent a donation organization. And uh, they just pay lip service to actually doing anything for anybody at this point. Steve, uh, this this uh, IAS fascinates me. I'm researching it for my my blog, the Scientology Money Project yeah. com. The International Association of Scientologists is the membership organization of the Church of Scientology. In other words, the Church of Scientology does not have members. Right. You cannot join the – and I'll go back one step further. There is no such entity called the Church of Scientology. Right. And what you do is you join a membership organization called International Association of Scientologists. Now, the IAS in and of itself cannot do anything. It's an unincorporated association. Therefore, it created the International Association of Scientologist Administrations – that's the operating arm. Right. And, and so you get the Sea Org, which is an unincorporated religious order. And on the other side, there's the IES members, public Scientologists. Yes. And they meet in a building owned by the Church of Scientology International or, or Flag Service Organization or the Free Winds. Yes. So the Church of Scientology owns the buildings, the ship in which delivery takes place. It's given by a member of an unincorporated religious order to a public member of an unincorporated membership organization and the money flows up lines. Right. Now, this is <clears throat> this points to something that's gone on in the church. It takes a lot of work to deliver an hour of auditing. You have a lot of people involved with folders, you know, case supervision, qual, on and on and on, right? Right. Exactly. And liability in case they don't want they didn't like their service or later want their money back. That's a huge oh, yeah. factor right there. Yeah, so by if I'm David Miscavige, if I just take free money for doing nothing, I, I mean, that makes a lot more sense. 
Why right. have a bunch of people who have cases going on? And, you know, you could go, you got to have people go type three, maybe even especially after Lisa McPherson. It's like, why are we going to engage in auditing? And compounding that matter, the church punishes auditors. If I mean, they really, if you know how the rule goes, if you were the last auditor to have audited someone who, you know, blew or left or spoke out. Oh, yeah. The auditors crucify. Right, absolutely. Which is an, which so, is another factor that keeps people there because they don't want to get their you know maybe the one or two people that are at a, they've actually felt you know a kindred sort of connection with and maybe they try to help them they don't want to actually get that guy you know crucified when they leave but there's not really much you can do about that so eventually people just leave anyway. Yeah, that's uh, it's an interesting thing. So you were there for when the IAS started yes. and it begins it, it begins to slowly take over the church. Yeah, Adian was in his office writing the issues and everybody was scrambling around. This was the this was the thing that was happening in the summer of nineteen eighty four when I first went to the Ant base. No no who's the E D N that's what? that's Guillaume Leserve, uh but I used mean, to be that means Executive uh, Director International. So he's supposed to be you. the top guy in the Church of Scientology Corporation. Um uh, you know, because uh, David Miscavige is not in the Church of Scientology. He's in the Religious Technology Center and so forth. So, so Guillaume is supposed to be the senior most official in the Church of Scientology International. Yeah, of course, now he's just a and, broken piece of mud today. No, uh, he's, uh, he's he completely has been, broken down. Been through hell. Right. And you're doing a secondary role. I mean, you, your role becomes secondary. Instead of disseminating, uh, disseminating the technology, selling books, etc., you they just take the program apart. Yeah, it's really just a matter of it's just manipulating and manipulation. He was manipulating me as a creative individual to do marketing for him, which wasn't actually in, even intended to actually be used, other than to show. All these uh, wealthy Scientologists at events, which are completely illegal, also per the per LR, what LRH said, um, you're not supposed to have these kinds of events, and they didn't used to. Um, so, but these you know wealthy Scientologists are shown, oh, we're going to do all these TV ads. It's going to be our biggest marketing campaign ever in history, and here's our new campaign. It's it's uh, you know know yourself, no lie. That was the that was a actually the. Uh, the marketing slogan that I came up with for this particular campaign that we're talking about, and in fact, so you 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 created "Know Yourself, No Life." Yeah, that was one of my wow. many many different contributions to you know my whole thing really started much earlier than that, and it's like you know to me the problem with the church was it was a cult, and you know anybody that couldn't see that was I don't know living in some other world, but as a marketing person, I always thought well that's the the obvious problem here. How are you going to get people in when you're a cult? So you've got to either you got to stop being a cult. So I tried to do that. That's what I set out to do. Is I tried to do that and to basically decultify um, Scientology because I could really see no an inherent reason why it needed to be a cult. Other than it obviously must be can somehow become that. And so uh, that was what I was trying to do through through marketing, and it actually started to take off. But but uh, but. You know, and when people started sending me fan mail for all the changes that were happening and Miscavige heard about that, that was the end of my, you know, marketing career in the church. I got transferred over into, you know, to head up script writing. And, and from there, things just went downhill. What was what was the first uh, crack in, you know, the reality system? What, what was the first crack in your reality when you said, I have to I have to leave the Sea Org and get out of here? Well, that's a great question. Really, it happened in 1990. Um, at that time, I was over all the Dianetics marketing uh, in, in every organization around the world. Jeff Hawkins was heading up the Dianetics marketing on what we call trade lines, in other words, through you know um, public bookstores and so forth. And in, but internally, inside the churches, I was over all Dianetics marketing um, internationally. So um, every country, every language, every organization, every mission, every you know group that was that was under me. And uh, and I had been to an, uh, a meeting um, in Clearwater where we had a lot of people from countries like, you know, Peru and, um, uh, you know, the eastern 
bloc nations, which had recently, you know, uh, sort of been able to, you know, rejo you know, participate in in the world in a new way, after, with, I guess with the fall of the USSR and that kind of thing. Anyway, a lot of those people came and they said, hey, you know, there's a problem there because the basic book of, di of, of you know, Dianetics and Scientology, which is called Dianetics, and which is supposed to be the uh, the way that we, you know, w were intended to reach out to new people and, and get them interested. The price of that book in some of these countries, you know, we're talking about third world countries, cost the equivalent of the average wage earner's monthly income to buy one really? book. Yeah, because by the time they were exported from the United States with export and, you know, import duties and VAT, you know, VAT taxes, and, and plus they were way expensive to start with, when you get through with the exchange rate of dollars to pesos or dollars to whatever it was, yeah, they were – so what these people were doing is they would pool their money and buy one book and then tear pages out of it and pass them around in a circle. And so you'd get 10 pages to read, and you'd read those, and when you were done, you'd pass them to the next guy, and you'd get the next 10 pages from the guy before you. And that's how – they were sharing – a whole community of people would have to share one book. So this was like – I thought this was the most insane thing ever. If the purpose of Scientology, which it supposedly was, is to reach out to new people and help as many people as possible, well, well this is directly blocking that, that uh, mission. So I put well, together – It certainly is. Yes. Yeah, so, and, and, and just to interject, this is a, a wealthy religious cult. Right. And w one question that's always asked, why don't they just give away copies of – Dianetics yeah. or news. Why don't they just give it away? You know, because the Gideon Bible Society right. has given away millions and millions of Bibles. They, and this is what I don't get, Steve. L. Ron Hubbard gifted his uh, entire intellectual property to the Church of Scientology. A point I keep making is why must the church make money on a gift? It was a, if it was a gift, you should give away the gift in turn. And the Jehovah's Witnesses have a very large gigantic publishing infrastructure it's in brooklyn and other places the jehovah's witnesses contrary to whatever the church of scientology wants to say the jehovah's witnesses have a much larger in-house printing capability it would dwarf anything or i'm sorry the church of scientology is dwarfed by what the jehovah's witnesses do and their whole point is you know they go door to door and they give away pamphlets or they ask for a dime or a dollar you know it's just low cost dissemination right this has always bothered me, even on little copies of The Way to Happiness, the average price the church tries to get is $4.25. It works out to that. Yeah. And the money just keeps amassing. Right. So what you're saying is, is they expected to sell a book that costs a month, month's wages in a third world country? Yeah, they were just pricing them at an in, in insanely high uh, rate. And so um, – you know, uh, it, what I did is I put together a whole a whole submission on uh, how we could get the books printed locally in e every one of these countries, how much it would cost, how to get them printed on sheet paper, just like the other books that are printed. Because, you know, every one of these countries, they have paperback books. And yes. and so – and I put together this whole, you know, proposal on how to get this done and bring the price of the books, you know, our most basic book down to where it would be affordable for people. It wouldn't be a barrier. Okay. Miss David Miscavige shot that down in flames and basically told, uh, you know, his brother Ronnie, who was in charge of all marketing at the time, that I was trying to degrade, uh, you know, L. Ron Hubbard's works. So at that point, um, you know, I, I, it, I was staggered because I realized that was the point in 1990 uh, that I realized it was in the summer. That I realized that David Miscavige is what the church calls a suppressive person. In other words, he's a sociopath. I didn't know the word sociopath back then, but um, that's the closest thing that the church has, you know, to that. I think it's descriptive of the same type of person, a person with just no moral regard for, you know, for for anybody but themselves. Um, that the church was being in the hands of a suppressive person, was being run by a suppressive, and as far as I could tell, nobody. In the church, nobody at the international base seemed to have a clue about this except for me. And you know what? I didn't know what to do. 
that is almost, uh, you know, it's pretty overwhelming because then I realized I was trapped at this place and because I had a wife there and I could just leave. But then what about her? So yeah. I decided, you know, well, I got to tell her, you know, what's going on because I, I'm because, you know, we had just been we had just got married two years before and I was in love with her still. So uh, I told her, I said, you know, you know, the, the problem with uh, with um, the uh, the problem with the international you know, headquarters here is that the senior execs are intentionally using fear and intimidation. They're misusing the subject of ethics to create an atmosphere of fear and intimidation. And um, within days of telling her that, I was suddenly told that I was going to the RPF, which was the Rehabilitation Project Force, which is basically yeah. the Scientology gulag or your, you know, your mind control, you know, reprogramming, you know, thing. I was basically sent off 90 miles away to to uh, Los Angeles, separated from my wife, and, uh, you know, I had to put on a black boiler suit and couldn't speak to anybody. I had no money. I literally went down there with like $3 in my pocket. Um, I didn't even have a toothbrush or a towel or a bar of soap. I had to, you know, borrow from other people. And, um, you know, it was pretty rough. And, and I would have left then. And, and I did really think hard about leaving. The only thing was I would have I had to leave my wife and I still loved her. So um, that was yeah, that's part of the that's part of the emotional blackmail the church has over people. Also, the, you, you mentioned uh, the financial problem. Look, you, you're sent to the RPF. You don't have a towel or a bar of soap. Right. And no toiletries, no toothbrush. One thing I want to draw our, our listeners attention to jail inmates, prison inmates are treated better than people on the RPF. No question about that. They got more rights. Well, one thing that's shocking in uh, the Church of Scientology's response to Lawrence Wright's book, uh, they they put up a hate website on Larry. Yeah. And after he wrote his book, and they actually, and this this is what I don't understand about the church. Maybe you could help me. Larry made a comment in, in his book that. Uh, more money is spent feeding prisoners than is spent on Sea Org members eating. Right. And this, this, the church was really stung by this. They're trying to argue that they spend more money than is spent in prisons. Oh, gosh. Because I think uh, uh, Mark Headley said there's Sea Org members are fed like, uh, you know, on a dollar a day. Yeah, that's right. And the, in California, at least in 2012, it was three dollars and forty one cents for a prisoner per day. You can't eat on that. Right. And and so you're already starving and as as uh Lawrence Wright makes evident in his book Going Clearer, which by the way is a great book. If you haven't read it, it's Going Clearer, Scientology, Hollywood and the Prison of Belief. Larry mentions this, the church specifically rebuts them. They don't like it when they're deeds are exposed. So you, you are RPF without a bar of soap, a towel, or a toothbrush. Yeah, and, and really given no reason. They, it was not explained at all why I was even going to the RPF, basically just that I was, you know, had created in turbulation, which was, means like created some, you know, it upset somebody, but they didn't say who. And Had your wife written a knowledge report on you? Well, I realized, I finally, you know, realized that long after the fact that that's exactly what happened. She had, she had basically, because she was in the ethics section, the very section which was involved in this sort of subversion of people and mind control. And that section was run directly by RTC. In other words, uh, you know, from, from, well, really, you know, it was, you know, it was, it was Marty's area. Um, and his direct junior, who was uh, um, Chris, uh, the heck is this? Um, well, anyway, it's, it's, you know, basically RTC people were in there all the time and they ran everything because that's, 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 how they, that's where they got all the dirt on people. And that's how they basically kept people in line was through. Well, let, me, let me ask you this. Is RTC the, the really the religious thought police within the church? Well, you know, it's. And, and, or is everyone the thought police? Well, you know, it's kind of like it's kind of like Nazi Germany. I mean, I guess I you know I hate that's probably a terrible you know uh, no, well, comparison. Call but, it then, but Soviet Russia. But, yeah, but I mean, even even in the, in these other places, and, and and you know, there there are actually many 
examples of a sociopath getting in control of a religious group or a corporation. It's happened so many times. And if you look back through history, it's happened to nations and countries time after time. And, you know, of course, there's a big effort generally to, uh, you know, to um, to rat out your neighbors. You know, if, if somebody is, you know, to, uh, you know, if, if you get, you know, they just because they always say, look, if if uh, if so and so is doing something wrong and we find out you knew about it, then you're going to be toast also. Oh, you'll be punished. You'll be for their punished crime. for their crimes along with them. So then you find out, you know, your next door neighbor was secretly planning to to run away with his family and cross the border. And then when he does and then they find out you knew about it or maybe they just, you know, just decide you you should have known about it and shoot you anyway. So everybody gets frantic about turning everybody else in. And I'm sure that my ex-wife at the time, I know that's what happened is she probably was, you know, troubled because I said this. And, you know, she was looking back on it, you know, just didn't have the, I guess, cojones to to uh, stand up to this type of, of stuff. And she probably, you know, went to somebody trusting, said, look, I'm, you know, uh, what are you worried about? Or what are you, how come you're, you know, you're not, you're not, you know, yeah. doing as well. What's up with you, you know, Sue? And she um, you know, they put her on the media. I'm sure she probably blurted it all out or or wrote up in a knowledge report that, uh, you know, her husband had told her this. And that is what interpolated, you know, upset, you know, the top people, which was would have been, uh, you know, David Miscavige, Mark Yeager, Guillaume, all the people who were involved in this subterfuge. Um, and therefore, I got, you know, shit canned. Yeah, it's like a how dare you have how dare you uh, have thoughts against the group exactly. and and really when when you describe uh, being RPF for having a thought and voicing a thought it it demonstrates two things one in the church of scientology the church is always the third person in the marriage bed right you can imagine a husband and wife laying there at night in bed having pillow talk well you might as well put the church right in between uh, man and wife right because you I, I've known too many people who've you know had been uh, knowledge reports written by their spouse or usually ex-spouse because it, it's a, it is a, a an atmosphere of fear yeah so on the one hand the Church of Scientology promotes to the world that it has effective solutions for living freedom spiritual freedom higher spiritual states blah 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 but in reality it's a very much a thought policed uh, internal security spying. The contents of your PC folders can be used against you. Right. And the church is just, it's such a, the church of Scientology is such a train wreck. It, it, it really is. And it engages in malicious behavior. And at the, at the root of it, one of the key problems that I'd like you to talk about is the massive brain drain out of the Church of Scientology beginning in the 90s forward, the loss of their best and brightest people. Right. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Well, yeah, there's a couple of things. And, and um, in fact, let me real quick tie up a couple of loose ends, and then we'll come back to the brain drain and the, and the dual, this, uh, this weird duality in the church where they've got, you know, supposedly got these great tools. But on the other hand, they're vicious. Um, and destroy, you know, marriage after marriage after marriage. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to mention back when we were talking about um, the formation of the IAS, one of the big factors also was was the liability of what they call advanced payments. In other words, um, starting in the mid 1980s, um, after, you know, I was only at the Ant base for about 24 hours, really less than 24 hours when I thought, you know, like, this place is the most insane madhouse on the face of Earth and I'm getting out of here. <laughs> And uh, because it was, you know, it was yeah. nothing like anything I'd seen before, you know, at, at, at any church or organization. I mean, these people were just nuts. They weren't, they didn't use, to my mind, they didn't use Scientology at all. They didn't even seem to know what it was or understand it. Um, but, but to know, so I went out to, to Clearwater to their, their, you know, to the, uh, the, what they call FLAG, which is their, their largest delivery organization in the world and became an executive there right away. And um, while I was there, uh, Flag started doing really well, and they started getting, um, uh, being able, you know, their income shot up from a few, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a, a week 
to over a million. And uh, this was huge. But so many people were paying for services because what they started doing is just pushing um, what they called hard selling. There was this crush sales techniques on people. They were getting people to mortgage their homes and max out their credit cards. And they were getting so much money coming into the church. And um, what that did is it created tremendous liability uh, of the advance payments because those were, by policy, refundable. So if a person put down $100,000 for some future services and services for his kids and his wife, and then if they didn't actually end up taking those services, they were, they were welcome to take the money back. And that could not happen. So there was a big, big, uh, always a big uh, problem with what about these advanced payments, these, what they call APs, advanced payments, because, because of the financial liability that they represented. And that's why they started going to straight donations through the IAS, because that money is, is not refundable. So, no, it's not. And you make an excellent point. When you donate to the IAS, you sign an agreement saying, I agree that this is not refundable. Exactly. And that is why they're doing it, because it's not refundable. And plus, it's, they, there's, no, there's no liability. I mean, they don't even have to deliver anything. It's just, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Um, give us some more. Well, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's free money. And yeah. in, in exchange, you get a certificate or a, a trophy. Right. Which is pretty meaningless, you know. Totally. Uh, it's 100% here, meaningless. And, and actually, it's not meaningless. You know, the bigger the trophy, the stupider you are. <laughs> That's the meaning of it, right? Well, okay. so. <laughs> well you, ha you have to wonder. Uh, uh, here in Los Angeles, uh, there was a, an OT, Richie Acanto, yeah. who donated. He uh, was associated with Survival Insurance. Right. He donated $10 million to the IAS. Right. Then uh, Richie went bankrupt. This is all in public documents. I'm not disclosing anything that's, that's not public. Right. But, you know, but that, that $10 million, I don't know if, if it was a pledge or how much he, he actually paid, but the point is that $10 million could have saved his business. Of course. And when I made public the uh, IRS 990Ts that showed $1.5 billion in book value yeah. spread among three entities. Yeah. Folks, if you're listening and still in the church, they have plenty of money. There is no emergency or crisis. The planet will not get cleared if you mortgage your house. The planet is not being cleared. In fact, what's being cleared are bank accounts right. of Scientology parishioners. That's, the, that's what's being cleared with speed and straight up and vertical expansion right. or is people's money, people's bank accounts, their credit card. Okay, so to get out of the liability for advanced payment, because if you – if you contractually take 100000 like you say, you have to deliver $100,000 in services. One of the screwball things of church finance policy is the very week you take in that $100,000, it goes up lines and it's gone. Right. And so the delivery organization like Flag is on the hook for $100,000 in delivery of services. Right. And it, so if they deliver in the future, they're not going to get paid for that. That's right. And that creates a problem. Yeah. Okay, and, so and, now you know, going and to... sociopaths are notorious for shortcutting things. So why go to all the trouble to have to deliver services when we can just go ask for money? No, demand money. No, threaten them until they give us the money. That's what they. So that's what the church does now because it's in the hands of a sociopath. Another point you asked about though was was this sort of duality about Scientology supposedly having all the tools to help people and help marriages and all this, but when you look at their actual statistics. Of the number of you know marriages that you know how what happens with in actual marriages and you're like man it's like divorce disaster you know city I mean they they've destroyed more lives than they put together and what is the what is going on and um, I had a comment on that if you'd like to hear it please yeah please well you know uh, in studying you know when I originally in 2008 I started you know working on uh, doing the research basically that resulted in Scientology Cult.com. Um, which, by the way, we get about 5,000 hits per day, every single day, um, wow. which is a huge amount of traffic. Um, it just keeps going up and up and up. And if you, it's a great website. Yeah, and if you, if you Google the, word, the words David Miscavige, that website is on page one. And if you Google the word Scientology, it's normally on page one or two. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's great. But uh, – um, you know, it was obvious that, that Miscavige was, was a bad apple and something had to be done. And um, 
the biggest issue that I saw and the, and the most effective way to, to fight it was to basically, I mean, there were various people that were, were standing up and, 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 you know, like Anonymous was doing a lot, you know, to, to, uh, to call foul on these criminal actions. But where were the Scientologists? Where were, where were Scientology's own people, uh, you know, who, were, who should be standing up and doing something about this or at least speaking out? And they were, there were none. There was nobody that was doing that. I mean, zero. So I thought this is what we've got to do because every time they have a, every, a non-Scientologist stand up, and talk about the church, the church would just counter that by saying, oh, he's a religious bigot. He's just persecuting us. He's a, he's a nut. And, exactly. and that was yep. very effective because people think, as well, yeah, he might be. I mean, he's certainly not a Scientologist. How would he know? And so I started this website designed to get Scientologists to stand up as Scientologists and say, hey, this place is full of corruption, criminality, and abuse. And here's what I've witnessed myself. And um, that's what made it so effective, and because the church had nothing, they had no comeback for that. They had no defense, and that's why I did it. You know, this is some pretty sophisticated you, marketing, in actual fact. But that's kind of my specialty. Um, I learned marketing in, you know, while inside the church. I didn't actually learn it from the church. I learned it from um, from a mar you know some advertising guys that were not Scientologists, but. I learned it while I was in the church, and that was a hell of a place to try to use marketing because it was, you know, a worst case scenario. So I got very good at having to figure out how to solve the worst case scenarios that there were. And so that's what I started. I've been doing since then now outside well, the that's, church. That's fascinating. If you know, uh, I guess if you know how to market Scientology, you, uh, I mean, that's you know how to market anything. Exactly. And you learn marketing not because of Scientology, but despite being in the church. No, your Scientology-cult.com is a sophisticated site, and it's got excellent content, essays by former members. And one thing that the listeners should know, people inside the church, they're programmed to tune out anything out there on the WOG internet. Yeah. Haters, bigots, lunatic fringe of the internet, you know, etc. Yeah. So they're programmed to tune out. But when you began your site... And then Marty and Mike, people inside the church were forced to listen. Yeah. Absolutely forced to listen because it was their own, you know, it was, it was former members of the church speaking out. Well, there was a big, you know, there was a silent, there was a lot of silent people who, who, who wanted to do something, but, but there had been no platform for them to do anything. Mine was really the first because mine, you know, I started before Marty, long before Mike did, and really, uh, and, you know, in actual fact, they used, I mean, I was in common with them. I, I, and and I, I told them, look, this is how you do it. And they emulated what Scientology Cult was doing. Scientology Cult set the direction and, and actually introduced um, the formula for here's how you do something online. Um, and before that, Marty was simply going to, uh, you know, I'm not trying to put Marty down. He, he's done he's done more for, for bringing, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, needed um, uh, correction of the church than, than probably any any other human being has ever done. But um, but you know, he, he well, but certainly, no, you you make a good point. No, your your site was sophisticated. I remember when it came out, and because it takes a lot of different types of websites, and and Marty was doing something very focused and necessary. Now you were doing well, Marty was going to the to the to the media. He was working with yeah. the St. Pete Times. And then, then later, he put up a one-page, a one-page uh, note that basically said he was there, and he, you know, if anybody needed help, you know, give him a call. And then he, he then later, he, when I, when Scientology cult took off, and he commented to me, said, "This, you've really got something here. I mean, I'm getting so much feedback from everybody about ScientologyCult.com." And so then he started a blog. You know, of course, I explained why it was this was the correct strategy is to go use the internet. Um, that was my angle from the beginning because, um, you know, I never really worked that much with the media and media is kind of hard to control because they tend to cut everything down into a soundbite. In other words, you talk for three hours and what, what gets used is 15 seconds. That's literally, and then they'll repeat the 15 second statement four times and that's your five minutes on CNN. Um, whereas, you know, with the, it, it's, just, it's just not, it's, uh, you know, one of the things that, that led me to start Scientology Call 2 was I actually called the FBI, contacted the FBI, and I said, hey, you know, here's the thing. I just, you know, I left the Church of Scientology. 
uh, they, you know, they got my wife, they got this, they got that. Um, and, you know, the guy on the phone, he was very nice, but he, he said, well, you know, frankly, I don't know how to put this, but this it's so unbelievable, you know, to hear about this. And I go, you know, that is really the problem. It's so fantastic. It's so incredible. It's so huge, you know, that this could something like this could be going on in America. You know, there were, where somebody's going to take your car keys and you're back behind razor wire fences with cameras and security guards and even a freaking guard dog. And you can't escape in the middle of the desert and that this could be going on is hard to grasp. And so I thought, you know, what we're going to have to do is have is put together um, a website where you've got the actual testimony from all these different people who were there. Put that all in one place and then and then then from that, the FBI would be able to see, um, oh, OK, wow, now we're starting to get it because all these stories they all weave together and they all corroborate each other, you know, whereas when you're telling lies, they never corroborate, you know, the, it all fall apart and break apart in the details because you can't make a platform based on lies actually fit together. No, and you, you make an act. Oh, yeah, you make an excellent point. Uh, Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard said, quote, incredulity of our data and validity. This is our finest asset and gives us more protection than any other single right, thing. Right. If certain parties thought we were real, we would have infinitely more trouble. Right. Without a public incredulity, we would never have gotten as far as we have, right. unquote. And so I have talked to law enforcement. Many, many people have talked to law enforcement, different federal agencies, local agencies. Yeah. And there is a certain amount of incredulity. Uh, uh, law enforcement rolling their eyes saying, oh, that can't be true. You can't lock people up, right. interrogate them, pay them, you know, $8 a week or pay them nothing, rice and beans. So right. there is a there is a certain amount of incredulity. And this is where the Internet has became such an important tool to expose the Church of Scientology. Right. And the the Internet is asymmetrical. The Church can't control it. It tries to. In fact, right now, Steve, uh, my wife Karen's uh, Surviving Scientology YouTube channel is under a cyber attack by unknown agents. Right. I, I suspect the Office of Special Affairs. Why? Because her channel has been so very successful. Well, yeah, who else would care? Exactly. No one has a reason to attack yeah. a YouTube channel on Scientology. It, it, it is of no interest outside of people who are interested in Scientology. Right. Which is a considerable audience, but uh, we have 2.1 million views, and now suddenly this attack. Anyway, back to back to what you were talking about. You began ScientologyCult.com as a way to reach Scientologists, and it was very successful. Well, and also FBI and the world at large, which is really, when you say Internet, we're really talking about the human race, you know, everybody on this planet. Absolutely. Bringing them to do something about the church is like going and getting your big brother because you, know, you couldn't handle the bully yourself. So, hey, you know what? I'm going to go get my big brother. Oh, yeah, it happens to be 8 billion people, and they're going to kick your ass. Yeah. That's sort of the con you know, part of the concept, too. And eventually, you know, it may take years, but you know, it's happening, and it continues to grow. Well, yeah, and I remember when Anonymous powered out with their first video. Yeah, me too. And – I was working as a critic, and I remember just being blown away by that video. Yeah, it was cool. I thought, what the hell is this? This is really a master stroke. It's genius. Yeah. Because you had anonymous, this polymorphous, pervasive, everywhere, nowhere, sending a public message to the Church of Scientology. And I tell you, that was just startling right. and amazing. It was really it showed the power of anonymous, yeah. the power of the Internet. Now, what you did in a different way was amazing because it reached into the psyche of Scientologists, right into the soul. And it communicated using the Scientology language. It gave specific names. You knew people, former executives. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you Jefferson Hawkins, Marty Rathbun, Mike Rinder. Karen de la Carrier, you just go down the list, uh, you know, and Hayden and Lucy James. And I mean, this just was amazing. So it, con it allowed a lot of former members of the church to constellate, especially Sea Org members. We, did, did OSA try to attack your website or you? Oh, yeah. I've had plenty of people come and, you know, but mainly in the form of, in, in the form of informants. 
uh, where suddenly somebody contacts me and they're like suddenly want to be my new BFF, you know, best friend for life. I never heard of this guy. He wants to come over to my house and, oh, yeah, he's doing something just like me. They think, you know, like, oh, he's also starting a – there was some joker here in Dallas that they – I'm sure they put here who said he was he was also, you know, fighting cults, and he was a copywriter, and which was bullshit. He was not a copywriter, I found out. And, um, you know, and I mean, they tried to they – they had this guy even move over to near where I live from, from his – where he was living, which was about 10 miles away. Um Actually, no, I think yeah, right. he, he got a job, like apparently like a few blocks away and then said, hey, you know, I'm working right over where you live. You know, I just ignored him and he sent me a bunch of stuff and tried to get me involved in stuff, which I just ignored all of that. So they've tried. But, you know, the thing is, you know, I, my my first couple of years in the church, I actually worked for the G.O. And my job at one point was to was to infiltrate the deprogrammers and this this whole what was called the anti-religious movement arm. In Dallas. Wow. Yeah. So you you're an old Guardians office criminal. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I was a volunteer at the time. Wow. I was just a public well, Scientologist, but I was. Let, let's diverge for a minute. So you were Guardians office, and you were sent in to infiltrate deprogrammers. Yeah, because what happened was uh, I joined the church, and my mother went to go find out about what is Scientology. She went to the library, and she saw this whole bunch of stuff that had been put there by Arm, the anti-religious movement. And they said I was being hypnotized and all this stuff, and she got just completely freaked out. <laughs> I mean completely freaked out. Well, sure. She's your mom. Yeah, and so so she called in. That resulted in – you know, my whole family got freaked out, and they called in a deprogrammer um, from California and <laughs> oh, and paid yeah. him 500 bucks to come here and deprogram me uh, along with – and my uncle, I didn't even know it, but he, he got uh, some priest here in Dallas, an Episcopal priest, to come over and – take part in it. It was like that guy was a goddamn demon. I mean, he was so creepy. Um, yeah. The programmer was way better than him. He, he was actually scary. The priest, he was preacher, Episcopal preacher here in Dallas. I can imagine. So, yeah. huh, well, creepy, man. But anyway, so I got all that. And I the reason they did all that is because I wanted to join staff. I didn't want to go to, you know, I wasn't finding anything in college that, that interested me. And, um, um, uh, and so I wanted to do something to make a difference, you know. I wanted to, I wanted to, you know. There's besides money, there's also meaning, you know. Meaning, you know, if you if you come to the end of your life and your life has no meaning, guess what? You're freaking trouble. Um, yeah. Meaning, I think, is more important than money, you know. I mean, what's money? You know, nothing. In the end, people always they feel this great big vacuum in their lives. You know, what's that vacuum? It's the lack of meaning because they never did anything to help anybody else or. They're not doing anything to help or their life, you know, didn't really have any purpose. They didn't really make any impact. So that's what I wanted to have. By the time I got to be, you know, an old man, I wanted to have be able to look back and go, I made a difference. I helped people. And yeah, I grew up in the turbulent 60s and the and the 70s when, you know, it was just one catastrophe after another between Watergate and Vietnam. I mean, you know, you know, drugs and all this crazy oh, yeah. insanity I mean, I, that was going on. Yeah. It's like, you know what? Somebody's going to have to pull finger and do something about the, the state of the world. Otherwise, we're not going to have one. The Cold War? I mean, nuclear, you know, bombs? I mean, it was in, you know, Dr. Strangelove, the world? It was crazy. So I thought, you know what? I'd rather do something about the world and, and leave it a better place than, uh, you know, continue on here at Southern Methodist University and get my degree in business and then go out there and be a wealthy businessman and get a nice house somewhere, you know, and, and wind. And that's it. So so uh, I found, you know, some seemed to be workable, a lot of workable stuff in Scientology. And so I wanted to join staff and that resulted in the deprogrammer coming out. So so I had to leave staff because at that time you couldn't be on staff and the, the, this connection was not allowed. It had been canceled. And you literally were not allowed to disconnect from your parents or anybody else. So I had to handle my parents. And so part of that was to infiltrate the armed movement in Dallas. And I found out about, you know, two or three, actually two uh, plan B programmings and reported up on that. So something could be done. And I met, you know, the, the local uh, people who were in charge of arm. And then my, my job was to break up their communication lines, in other words. So to do that. I, we use Scientology in reverse. So you would actually, uh, you know, uh, start a, start rumors about somebody or say, oh, you know, I met somebody uh, that knew you just the other day. But then you wouldn't tell them who it was. You just leave them like that and drive people crazy. 
you know, who's this, who's he talking to, you know, um, you know, whatever you could think of, you know, to, to, to break up their communication lines. And part of that also was to get my mom involved in doing something else other than fighting cults. And so I researched and I decided, you know what, she used to be interested in painting pictures. And so I'll get her back interested in painting. again. so I started encouraging her, hey, mom, you ought to start painting again, that kind of thing. And she did. She started painting again, and I got her more and more interested in that, or, you know, she did anyway, and she started painting. She took that painting and um, and then started playing down, you know, the whole anti-cult thing. Um, so I know how they work. So what are their, their key things they're going to try to do to me when I start Scientology cult is they're going to, one, try to, in, you know, break up any of my communication lines. That's number one. Number two, they're going to try to repurpose me, what I call repurposing. I was to get you involved in something else other than exposing the crimes, abuse, and criminality of David Miscavige and the Church of Scientology. So there- and let, me inter- let me interject there because this is what, a line that the Church of Scientology runs on everyone through OSA. Yeah. Don't you have anything better to do? Oh, yeah. I had people come to me like they sent Yale, yeah. Yale, uh, an operative named Yale Sherlock out to my house. And she, you know, I thought she was, she was an old friend of mine for marketing, but she was, you know, we sitting there, um, we go out to dinner and she's saying, you know, I just want to make money. You know, I just want to make money, Steve. I just want to make, you know, tons of money and have be able to buy whatever I want. And, and it's just like basically trying to encourage me, see, like, yeah, yeah, you know, get rich, make a lot of money. That's what she was trying to do, obviously, because I found out she was working with Tommy Davis. In the end, oh man! So it was a whole the whole little scam they ran on me. But in the end, I you know I saw through it and didn't you know didn't bite on the worm. Um, but here's here here's my Steve. What I wanted to say relative to what you're saying about them trying to handle you. Yeah. My answer because I was recently someone very important recently asked me, "Don't you have anything better to do?" Right, right. Oh yeah, I had people and, like that too. And and I recognized the line, and I said that. Freedom of religion in America is so very important, yeah. and that's why religious tax exemption exists, so that people of faith, you know, can have tax-free dollars to spend. Right, and, and that's how it's been. It's enshrined in the Constitution, and you know, in Treasury regulations, everything. Right, and it, it religious tax exemption doesn't belong to a bunch of glib con artists. Right, and it really goes to the very integrity of the IRS, freedom of religion, to have a bunch of glib con artists called the Church of Scientology abusing tax exemption. Yeah. So I think protecting the Constitution, freedom of religion in America is a very important thing that I do as an American citizen. So I do plenty of things. And this is one of the, a very important thing to expose fraud, dishonesty. It really, the Church of Scientology creates such enormous human suffering, misery, bankruptcy. It does. And so, yes, this is something very important to do. Right. For my particular life and karma, call it what you will. Yeah. And so that's really the answer. But, but the church will try to invalidate people. Don't you have anything better to do? Oh, yeah. They'll try to say, you know, like I had people contact me on the phone just out of the blue, like people I haven't spoken to in 10 years. And all of a sudden they're suddenly, hey, how are you doing? You know, wow, wow. Well, that's great. So what are you doing? Like apparently they know nothing about me. Then all of a sudden out of the blue, they'd say something like, well, you know, I just don't want to get in any mudslinging. (laughs) Crap he's talking about, asshole. And then I would just <laughs> nail their ass to the wall because I know exactly what's going on. And uh, I, I had someone contact me to try to get me to take down the uh, Scientology 990Ts for my website. Right. This person said, you know, any Scientologist still in the church who reads these, you know, your website, ScientologyMoneyProject.com, will think it's all black, black PR. It would be better if it were at a neutral website. <laughs> right, right, sure. And and my answer was, look, they're, they're public documents. Take them and you post them at a neutral website. They're staying here. Right. And and now with this attack on Karen's website, and what just by way of comparing notes for our listeners, the Office of Special Affairs very much tries to infiltrate, yeah. neutralize, invalidate. 
Right. And uh, that's just part of their operation is to try to shut down in theta online, yeah. handle it, contain it. Yeah, any way they can. And another way they they've also will try that is what I call love bombing. Say, so, you know, I just like I just one guy in particular and he knows who, who he is. But he contacted me repeatedly and would say stuff like, you know, I'm just into loving everybody and and, uh, you know, everybody's my friend. I don't care if they're in the church or not in the church or, you know, and ultimately we just, you know, we have to come all together, you know, and that's the only time you can solve things is when we're all really on the same side, you know, and it's really all know, about by the love. Way, yeah, it's all about love. And yeah, oh, right. by the way, why don't you take down your website? <laughs> yeah, right. And, and, and we're going to keep on abusing people and destroying human lives and creating and people dying of cancer and leukemia and everything else because we're. We're, you know, so overtly suppressing them and we're just going to love, but we're going to solve it all through yeah. love. Sorry, bullshit. Yeah, no, we're not. Yeah, we're going to solve it by exposing what's going on here. Yeah, you are the man. I mean, that is correct. Right. It's uh, we do things our way and the church can keep, keep doing things yeah. their way, which doesn't work. Right. Nevertheless. Well, you know, one, one last thing I wanted to mention because you had asked me about it was this odd thing about the tools to help. It, it, can I mention this part? Oh, please. Okay. Yeah. Well, this, you know, people always say, why, why is, did people even get into Scientology if it's so bad? Right. And, and, and that's the obvious question. You know, I mean, you don't find people going down and signing up for the local, you know, mafia or the local, uh, you know, some, some, something, you know, is terrible. So why do they do it with the Church of Scientology? And the weird thing is, is because it actually has a lot of good stuff in it. But it also has a lot of evil stuff. And what happens is people get involved and they find the good stuff first because the evil stuff isn't promoted. And they think, wow, man, this is it. I found it. At which point everything else gets like this blanket. OK, or at least I'm not going to I'm not going to argue with it because this stuff is so right. You know, it, I, they can't imagine that it would also be evil at the same. There would be some evil part of it. Right. Like a split personality. Yeah. And so. They think, well, I don't know, you know, what do I know? Maybe this is right, or maybe he knows better, you know. I don't want to, you know, and and so uh, so there's there's the honey part that attracts the bees, which is actually useful and good, and then there's the the vicious part, and the vicious a lot of the vicious part, in fact, you know, didn't even start with with uh, with David Miscavige. I mean, he he is a sociopath, and he needs to be held accountable for his actions because I don't care whether he's got you know um, you know a stone tablet. From, from the Almighty that says it's okay for him to do X, Y, and Z. If it's a criminal action, it's a criminal action, and he, needs, he has to be held accountable. And anybody else that supports that kind of thing, you know what I mean? Certainly. You, you, you oh, murdered certainly. somebody, you need to go to jail, and you can't tell the judge and the jury, well, you know, hey, L. Ron Hubbard told me to do it. Sorry, that's no, not an excuse. No. So, no, any, more than, any more than Jesus or, or Allah told me to do it. Right, exactly. So... So, um, but nevertheless, I mean, you know, uh, there's there's been a consistent, you know, um, uh, uh, I'd say furor, you know, about L. Ron Hubbard's role in all this. And the actual fact, when you actually study up on him, on his life and his his actual deeds, I mean, you know, he he apparently said numerous times that he he, you know, if you want to get rich, start a religion. And um, you know, it's too many people seem to have heard him say that. And there's too much in the way of uh, you know, supporting evidence for it that, that actually shows – I think that's why he did start it in the first place. And you know, his motives were not all pure. There's a lot of people that start things for bad reasons. And sometimes, though, the things that they start turn out to be – there actually is good in them. And um, um, you know, certainly there, you can't find any – paragon of virtue that ever started anything. I mean, every single person had had, you know, hidden stuff in his life and he was committing adultery left and right or whatever, or he was, you know, having kids by other women, you know, on the side and he was involved in stuff that wasn't perfect. Um, but in, in Hubbard's case, I mean, it goes a little bit beyond that to where there was some actual, you know, pretty vicious stuff. And, you know, this whole thing of fair gaming people, which is which is basically if you cross me, then the gloves are off. I'll do everything in my power to destroy you, and I'll never forget, and I'll keep after you until I destroy you, and we even the score. That's, that came out of Hubbard's own psyche, and he put that into the church. And so um, 
So there's a lot of, you know, question about even if you got rid of Miscavige, you know, would it fix the church? Well, no, of course not. Just getting rid of Miscavige is step one. But it isn't the solution. It's just step one. It's like the first thing you've got that got to happen. And there still be a ton of work after that. But um, but the the problem is you have, you know, there was a great movie and it was called um, um, it's one of my favorite sci fi movies of all time called The Forbidden Planet. You ever seen it? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, I think it's 1958, the year I was born. And um, and it was an excellent movie because it's in color. But it's all about it's a psychological based drama about uh, about this, you know, this ancient race that had the ability to they built a machine that could materialize anything. So if you just thought, hey, I want a glass of water, bing, a glass of water would appear in your hand. Um, or if you wanted a million bucks, boom, a million bucks would appear, bing, in the floor, right? And um, um, and they all got destroyed because what happened is their their id, you know, the the, the evil psycho part of your mind that that's the animalistic and 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 you know vicious, that actually also uh, was able to access this machine unbeknownst to the to the people who were using it, and so they all can you know their through their ids conceived their worst nightmares and were devoured and destroyed by all these monsters which the machine made appear one night. Um, yeah, I remember that's what the movie's about. And Hubbard kind of did the same thing. The same thing happened with him. He 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 started out for a bad reason. St- found something incredibly good and did something um and you know he spent the next 30 years or so of his life working pretty much full time i mean people that know him and worked with him said he was the hardest working person they ever met and these were people who also saw the bad side of hubbard and the mean side and they said you know he did you know he did things and he he that that were were just undeniably beneficial to people and that's why you know, some people, uh, you know, will say, well, I'm, you know, I still use a lot of Scientology. They're talking about the good parts of it. And but simultaneously, he instilled in this creation these these horrific attributes like, I'm, you know, if, if anybody criticizes Hubbard or Scientology, we're never going to forget. We're going to come after you and destroy you no matter what. And we'll be well, relentless. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, th- there there is revenge at the heart of it. Right. I was talking to a journalist once, and I said, look, here's an analogy. It may be imperfect, but Henry Ford invented the assembly line, yeah. and he allowed us to build cars, you know, make cars cheaper and accessible. Now, Henry Ford was a vicious anti-Semite. He was right. a Jew-hating son of a bitch. That's established. He uh, really supported Hitler before World War II. Right. Now, now – I drive a car. Does that mean I support Henry Ford's anti-Semitism? Absolutely not. Right. It's not even connected. Right. And, and I try to explain to the journalists, look, some people find certain usable things in Scientology, and they left the church because they don't support Hubbard's evil side. Within the ex- expanse of human consciousness, there is both good and evil. Right. And for whatever Hubbard – and we're not debating Scientology here for our listeners. That's a separate show are a series of shows, uh, whatever efficacy certain people find and certain people find Scientology appealing, whatever efficacy or usefulness they find, Hubbard's evil, malicious stuff that was incorporated into the organization remains. And so in my experience, people have suffered that malice that's incorporated into the church. Yeah. And they've left. They've left, and they so they keep what they find workable and usable, and they leave the church because the organization itself is is vicious, vindictive. It's an right. out of control machine that must be cruel and abusive, yes, stingy. Yeah. And 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 so the church is falling apart. And 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 to your point, Steve, the church's Scientology is inherently self-destructive. Things that are not good to do, it does, and it's destroying itself, and it's doing it to itself. No question about that. And it's astonishing to me for a group that claims to have tremendous spiritual insight to not get it that it's destroying itself. It's not psychs, wogs, suppressive persons, degraded beings, one ones. I mean, this is all stuff they mocked up. Yeah, with the church is yeah the church is doing it to itself by its own actions. Right. If well, a lot. And I, 
Yeah, but a lot of the church's history is, is actually false, you know, like Hubbard made it up. For example, he said he went on all these great, he was, you know, member of the Explorers, Explorers Club, which he was, but he really got there by kind of fraudulent means. You know, he says he had three different, he went on three different uh, um, expeditions, you know, uh, and, but in actual fact, when you read what happened, was, quote, expeditions, I mean, one of them was a vacation. Actually, two of them were simply vacations that both went awry and nothing ever happened. Like he didn't produce one single, you know, beneficial thing from this expedition. And in other words, he turned a vacation and called it an expedition to get a bunch of free gear so he could, you know, take a motorboat up to Alaska, which he. Yeah, that was the, the, yeah, the, the radio thing, yeah. uh, so, radio navigation. So he was no, doing this false stuff from the beginning, even long before Dianetics and Scientology came along. He was creating this false persona about L. Ron Hubbard as this great adventurer explorer, which he was using to sell his fiction books. So when Sci then Dianetics took off, well, he already had created this big, huge lie about himself. And um, and, you know, he was no he was not, you know, he was a womanizer in the early you know foundations. He always attributes those to, oh, because it was the communists were in there or because, oh, they didn't do, you know, they didn't they didn't, uh, you know, deliver, uh, you know, they didn't properly deliver services. You know, they just got embroiled in other stuff. Well, hey, Hubbard was the one that was running up tens of thousands of dollars in bills and living like a king at the time. And in fact, in 1950, when the first people who responded to to Dianetics wanted to get trained. He he trained them up. You know how much the training cost? Five hundred bucks. Yeah. Five hundred bucks. That's a lot of money. That's a third of a car back then. Average car cost fifteen hundred dollars today. The average car cost you know that's that's the equivalent of like what five thousand dollars today. So oh, sure. And and you know Steve, the, the the stuff you're talking about. One of the best books out there is Barefaced Messiah by Russell that's Miller. What I'm, that's what I really what I'm. Uh, I yeah. just, you know, I finished reading recently, and it just shows that, you know what, that that is the kind of thing that that is evidence that his effort was to to basically get rich because instead, you know, we're in Dianetics. He said, hey, this is a planetary thing. We got to reach out to the only way to to solve the to, to prevent mankind from destroying itself, right? Which through nuclear war or some other insanity is to make one person sane, you know, at one at a time, to make people sane one by one. And which actually kind of makes sense. That would be the only way you could really do it. But but when it comes to actually implementing that, he's charging five hundred bucks a head. That doesn't make sense. That no no. And this is a this is a great place to stop because we're we're, we're at about the hour mark, a little over it. And I'd I'd love to have you back on the show because Steve ultimately. In one sense, Scientology is a big marketing campaign, and in the context of the 1950s, Hubbard wrote a book that just went viral, top bestseller list, yeah. because people did want answers to nuclear war. Oh well, yeah, and uh, you know other other things that were going on back then, McCarthyism, and you know, so the marketing of Scientology. What I like to do in our next show is talk about the use of language in Scientology. Because it uses a distinctive form of uh, superlativity, the use of superlatives, hyperbole, yeah. cosmic themes. I'd like to really, one, go back to what we didn't finish this hour, the brain drain out of Scientology. Yeah. But also I'd like to really talk to you as a writer about Scientology's very unique use of language and how it's morphed or degraded into Sherman speak in recent years. Yeah. I'd like to compare notes on that because – I don't think there's enough focus uh, on the use of language on a very particular type of language. And since you wrote a lot of the language, I think it would be a great show for people who are interested in writing and the use of propaganda, yeah. uh, the use of marketing. And, and I think in the 1950s, that was certainly Hubbard's genius. Uh, his dark genius was how to market and sell. Right. Well, you know, marketing That's, is involved in everything, and marketing gives has, has a collection of tools by which you can analyze things and, and get things done, take things apart, and figure out how to fix things. And really, nothing else but marketing can can that's its value. You know, when it's used properly, it's not you know taking a bunch of crap and, and and making it popular. It's 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 helping people understand what something really is. Because that's the real marketing. That's how I'm using yes. it. I'm helping people understand sure. what Scientology really is. You know, when we're talking about yeah, it's a it's full of abuse, criminality, corruption. In addition, it's got some good things. 
but you know it's not really usable unless at some point we pry those things apart and separate the wheat from the chaff and nobody's done that yet yeah distinguish the, the unlike things well let's let's begin on that in our next show uh steve hall it's been a pleasure having you on the show the time just flew by yes it did uh, steve hall his website scientologycult.com it, very interesting content rich Karen and I post our YouTube videos there because we believe so very much in Steve and his work. Steve, great having you on for Surviving Scientology Radio. This is Jeffrey Augustine. We're available online at survivingscientologyradio.com. And as always, we'll be in very good touch. Thank you.